the establishment left has just dropped entirely. So the Democratic Party, which, whatever that is, uh, abandoned the working class a uh, generation ago. Okay, let's get straight into the questions. Is that all right? Oh, yeah. Okay, so Peter, you can mute your mic if you don't mind. Got it. Okay. Okay, so what I wanted to know is, uh, first I wanted to define the left, and essentially the way that I'm going to do that is by asking you, what are the traits in the left, the left, political left, in the past century that have changed, and what's remained the same, as far as you can tell? Well, of course, the left has uh, moved consistently to new issues that weren't even noticed before. So if you go back a century, well, there were elements of the left that you could call, say, feminist. It's nothing like uh, the dominant, uh, dominant uh, element in uh, left uh, politics that exists today. Uh, you go back uh, 20 years ago, there's very little concern about the environment. Now the left recognizes that it's an existential problem. Uh, the, uh, on the other hand, and so there are many cases in which there's been uh, progress in understanding and dedicated work. There are other cases in which there's regression. So uh, go back uh, not very far, uh, a couple of decades, uh, labor organizing was a major issue for the left. It was recognized, understood that the driving force in any social and political economic change is going to be an organized working class. Uh, that's been, well, it depends what you call the left, but the, but the, the establishment left has just dropped entirely. So the Democratic Party, which, whatever that is, uh, abandoned the working class a uh, generation ago, handed it over to their class enemy. Uh, activists on the left have become engaged justifiably with uh, issues that are sometimes called identity politics. Those are real issues, have to be dealt with, but class issues have been sub uh, subordinated, uh, marginalized, and they're very real. Uh, that's uh, a deficiency that has to be overcome. Uh, all of these things interact uh, when people talk about intersectionality, yes, they're right, uh, but it's been more of a slogan than a uh, an actual achievement. So I think if you look across the board, there's progress and regression. What is your opinion on identity politics? The issues are significant. Uh, they have to, they enter, they cannot, each type of identity politics cannot dominate uh, a, a, a commitment of an organized left that hopes to achieve things. They have to interact, be mutually supportive, and they have to crucially bring in the class issues that have been subordinated. Uh, actually, the most active extreme form of identity politics is white nationalism. Something I'm trying to determine with my research is when does the left go too far and when does the right go too far, politically speaking? And I wanted to know what your opinion is on that. Just to pick the issues. I mean, the right at this point is simply suicidal. Uh, it's not a question of going too far. The right is committed to destruction of organized human society. Is that an extreme statement? Maybe, but it's correct. Uh, just take a look at the Republican Party. Uh, what is the Republican Party committed to? It's committed to destroying human life, and not in the long term. Uh, the Paris Agreements a couple of years ago, they weren't fabulous, but they were something at least. Uh, their original effort intent was to create a a treaty in which there would be verifiable commitments to some measures to avert the huge threat of global warming. Couldn't get a treaty. It had to be a, a voluntary agreement. Now why? Republican senators wouldn't accept it. I take the uh, Republican primary in 2016. 
every single candidate, without exception, either denied that global warming is taking place or else said, maybe it is, but we don't care. Uh, we're going to, John Kasich, who was the governor of Ohio, who was considered the real moderate of the group, said, yeah, we, we uh, recognize that global warming is taking place and it's serious, but we in, Chicago, in Ohio are going to use our coal and we're not going to apologize for it. Now, that's the moderate Republican. Then you go over to the White House, you have total maniacs. Now, people who say, we don't care. I said, we'll destroy the world, but we'll have profit tomorrow and are leading the way towards destruction, consciously aware of what they're doing. No secret about it. Easy to demonstrate. No. How far to the is this? I mean, there's no words for it. And one, no, one question. What about the left? When does the left go too far? It's not a matter of going too far. It's a matter of pick, making tactical decisions that are incorrect. You have to, if you, you may, there's some, it may be that some of the goals go to, are debatable. We could talk about that. But insofar as they're the kinds of goals that, say, we think we can support, you have to ask whether the tactics that are used are well designed to meet those goals or else undermine the goals. So let's take concrete cases. Uh, as you know, I was very active in the anti-war movement resistance movement during the 1960s, had contact with Vietnamese. The Vietnamese were appalled by the, some of the tactics that were being used. Uh, I remember meetings uh, where, where the Vietnamese would plead with American activists not to do things like what the weathermen are doing. Um, the weathermen, a lot of young people, many of them I knew, they were perfectly sincere. They thought that the way to end the war is to smash up uh, windows on Main Street. It's not the way to end the war. Now, that was the way to enrage uh, construction workers and others so they'd be more pro-war than they were before. Uh, the Vietnamese didn't care whether Americans felt good. Uh, they cared whether they could survive. So what they advocated were measures so mild that a lot of the war movement would just laugh at them. But that's the kind of choice that has to be made all the time. I can give you many examples today. So going too far, I think the way we should rephrase that is uh, picking tactics that are going to undermine the perhaps, the perhaps legitimate and just goals that you say you're advocating. On the discussion of um, the left and the right, in terms of their differences and their similarities, oftentimes the left are characterized as being pro-government and the right is characterized as by being pro-corporation. And you have written about the revolving door between the two, between regulators and the regulated, in your book, like Manufacturing Consent. Now, does this blur the line of what it means to be a left-winger and a right leader, do the left and the right still exist? Did they ever exist? I mean, let's take being pro or anti-government. That's not a, a general position of the left. That's a tactical choice in particular circumstances. So when you have uh, a state like the United States that's largely dominated by private tyrannies, with very little of a public voice. In that particular circumstance, uh, the option available to you to overcome this is governmental action, which at least to some extent is responsive to public opinion. In other circumstances, when you're trying to construct a really uh, libertarian left participatory society, you might want to dissolve governmental structures as uh, illegitimate authority. There's no right or, left, right or wrong answer to that. So, for example, let's take, uh, take say, media. Okay. Uh, the United States is uh, unusual. It's uh, just different from other developed societies in many respects. Uh, one respect is it doesn't have public, barely has public media. Okay. Media are privatized, overwhelming. It's a kind of a little tiny fringe on the left, nothing like, on the, off the fringe, you know, so like nothing like the BBC or anything like that. 
uh, we can look at why this happened. Certainly not implicit in U.S. history, like the founders of the country, the framers, uh, believed they interpreted the First Amendment uh, very differently than the way we do. They thought it meant that the government ought to take an active role in sponsoring a free and independent press. That's why we have the post office, for example. In its early years, the post office was almost totally devoted to providing a cheap, uh, free, basically subsidies to uh, a wide variety of uh, journals and newspapers to encourage a varied, uh, free, independent press. Uh, over the years, the uh, power of private power in the United States, which is quite unusual, managed to privatize uh, radio, television, and more recently the internet. Uh, but that's, and yes, in those circumstances, it would make sense to call for a public voice. Under other circumstances, you might want to have local, uh, local uh, uh, based, uh, you know, worker based, community based uh, media. And there's many other such questions. You're a self-described anarchist, and I'd like to know what is the difference between your beliefs and contemporary libertarianism? Well, first of all, what's called libertarian in the United States is some ultra-right uh, advocacy of private tyrannies. It's nothing, nothing like anything that was libertarian traditionally. But if you're talking about left libertarian, it you know, covers quite a range, but uh, just as the term anarchism does. But there is a kind of a core uh, at the center of it, I think. Uh, the core uh, running through the whole tradition with many variations is the recognition that there are certain structures uh, in social, political life, economic life that are... Uh, that, uh, have to justify their own legitimacy. They are coercive, uh, authoritarian, uh, there's hierarchy, domination, somebody gives the orders, somebody takes them. Uh, all of those structures have to be, are, are, none of those structures are self-justifying. They have a burden of justification. If they can't meet it, which is almost always the case, they should be dismantled. I think that's the core principle. And my own view is that once you get to the basics, almost every normal person is an anarchist in this sense. But that's then you have to ask how it applies. So do you have a job somewhere? Well, if you have a job in a business corporation, let's say, you're living in a tyranny so extreme that no totalitarian dictator ever dreamed of it. So for example, Stalin, uh, didn't tell people uh, that you have 10 minutes to go to the bathroom every couple hours. Uh, you have to wear these clothes, not some other clothes. You're not allowed to stop to talk to a friend for a minute. Uh, you're, you're monitored, say, at an Amazon warehouse, so that if you don't pick up enough things fast enough, you, like you, maybe you stop to uh, breathe or something, you get a demerit. There was no totalitarian dictatorship like that. That's most of people's lives. Well, is that a legitimate... Uh, uh, st structure is the labor contract legitimate? Actually, traditional uh, classical liberals didn't think so. Uh, Abraham Lincoln didn't think so. The Republican Party didn't think so. The Republican Party's slogan in the mid 19th century, early Industrial Revolution, was that uh, wage labor is indistinguishable from slavery, except that it's supposed to be temporary until you become a free person again. Well, okay, that's. Uh, that those ideas have been driven out of people's heads, but I don't think they're very far below the surface. They can emerge again. And uh, that would be authentic uh, left libertarian, it, just one aspect, crucial aspect. So it seems like you overlap with regards to free exchange of speech and ideas. And I remember a while ago, you helped, you defended a Holocaust denier, and I wanted to know if you still stand by that. Defending a Holocaust denier. I mean, defending his freedom of speech. Sure. I mean, this is just standard classical liberalism. Uh, you, there's two choices. Uh, either uh, some form of power and authority, typically the state or other, 
determines what's true and punishes any deviation from what it claims is true, or else uh, you allow views to be expressed that you don't like. In fact, if you really believe in freedom of speech, uh, the only issues are, do I allow speech that I don't like? Uh, Hitler and Stalin had nothing against speech that they liked. Nowadays, there's this trans rights versus free speech really debate. And I, I want to know what you think about that. Where do you lie on that? Let's talk about Holocaust denial for another minute. Uh, the Holocaust denial is the norm in Western society. So, uh, for just to take an example, a couple of years ago, uh, an article appeared in the New York Review, the, the major journal of left liberalism. Uh, in which the author, good, decent left liberal, was reviewing a book by a major American historian uh, who said that, and he said in his review, he was he was interested to learn that when the early explorers came to the Western Hemisphere, uh, there were only about a million people from the tropical forests uh, to the frozen north. He was off by about 60 or 70 million who were wiped out. Is that Holocaust denial? Did anybody say he should be uh, imprisoned? Or did anybody even notice? Yeah. I mean, these things happen all the time. Uh, it's uh, a particular form uh, that we don't like, that, is, that somebody doesn't like, that's considered, that has to be suppressed. And that's worth keeping in mind when you talk about Holocaust denial. Hmm. So it seems like you have some similarities with Jordan Peterson on this issue, and I know that you haven't talked much about Jordan Peterson, and I wanted to know if you had any disagreements with what he says. Frankly, I pay very little attention, but uh, if you want to know about Jordan Peterson, I think the best thing I can refer you to is an article by uh, Nathan Rob Robinson, very sharp, acute critic in his journal, Current Affairs. It's called something like uh, The Intellectual We Deserve or something like that. I think that that's basically my answer. Other than that, I don't pay any attention. I mean, there's some issues on which I probably agree with Hitler. No, it doesn't mean much. On that subject, I, I think it's um, Aristotle, right, who says, that people get the governments they deserve. Okay. Is this kind of the line? Oh, Aristotle said that people get the governments they deserve. Is this no. kind of what you're uh, implying, but for intellectual? No, I don't think people get the government they deserve. They get the government that power systems impose. That's quite different. On the systems of power, uh, you had mentioned in manufacturing consent the idea of the principle of bureaucratic affinity, the idea that large-scale bureaucracies will ally with other large-scale bureaucracies to sort of maintain a status quo and to uh, aid each other, and that when a company like, when a media company, for example, tries true journalism, these large bureaucracies, be it either the government or corporations, will give the media company flack and sort of cease to work with them. My question for you is, uh, my question for you is, does the principle of bureaucratic affinity apply to educational institutions like large universities? To a varying extent. Uh, it depends on the university, it depends on the time and the era. You know, there's, uh, uh, in, in our current uh, situation, current circumstances, uh, with all their flaws, the uh, universities are one of the last uh, bastions, uh, bastions of uh, relative freedom of expression and research, even of uh, worker self-government to a certain extent. A faculty at a university has a degree of control over their working lives, which is very rare in the uh, existing socio-political system. So I don't think you can answer a simple yes or no. By comparative standards, they're relatively free. They have flaws. Uh, so for example, if you take a look at the American university system, 
until about just a few years ago, you couldn't find a Marxist professor anywhere. Okay? Any other country in the world, they'd be all over the place, not here. May I ask, what do you attribute that to? Uh, in your in past comments, you had mentioned how academics maintain a sort of status quo, uh, as opposed to being the sort of radicals that they uh, display themselves as. Do you find that still true, or do you find that academics um, are changing? Well, okay. and there's a kind of an ebb and flow. I think it's less true than it was 50 or 60 years ago, but it's more true than it ought to be. And it's not just academics, it's uh, intellectuals generally. You look over the whole history of intellectuals you know, for a couple of thousand years, in fact, and you find that overwhelmingly uh, they tended to support power systems. Uh, there are a few who don't, and they're usually treated pretty harshly. In fact, just take the, the term intellectual in its modern sense was first used at the time of the Dreyfus trial in France, late 19th century. Uh, most of the intellectuals, the prestigious intellectuals, the ones of the you know, French Academy and so on, bitterly condemned the Dreyfus arts. How dare these writers and artists uh, question the majesty of our army, state, and so on. And there were a few like Emil Zola, a couple of others who stood up against it. They were persecuted and we may honor them today, but not at the time. Emil Zola had to flee France. You know? That's the re record in one form or another all through history. So in fact, shortly after, uh, after this, the First World War came along. It was very dramatic to see what happened to the intellectual classes uh, during this uh, including the left during the First World War, in every single country, Germany, France, England, the United States, the intellectuals lined up almost 100% in passionate support of their own country. Uh, the ones who didn't, many of them ended up in jail. Bertrand Russell, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, Eugene Debs. But that's the pattern. We're back. We're back. Peter, do you want to repeat the question? Super my, quick. This is my wife. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, Professor Noam Chomsky's wife. <laughs> okay. Um, the question in summary was, in manufacturing consent, you teach us that big media is allied with the government, the corporate elites. And as a result, the framework of big media's discussion uh, fits comfortably in a propaganda model, an acceptable framework on how to analyze problems and talk about issues. Well, if, if academia itself is allied with government and corporate elites, then wouldn't they also fit a propaganda model? And if not, what makes them so unique? Well, for one thing, there's several things that are, to some extent, it's true. But notice that the relation of media to say corporate elites is very different from the relation of universities to corporate elites. In the case of media, it's just that's what they are. The media are major corporations, uh, parts of bigger corporations, uh, flow in and out of government, you know, uh, very heavily subject to uh, government uh, edicts and so on. Uh, universities have the same influences, but much less so. The relation of a university to corporations is, can I get a grant, you know? Uh, will I get a, will there be a donor who will be willing to build a building or something? That's very different from being a uh, part of the corporate system, which already allows a little flexibility. Uh, also, there is, we should not underestimate the fact that there is a, a sense of uh, professionalism and, uh, 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 intellectual responsibility. That's true in the media too. Uh, there are serious journalists, who, many of them who understand the system very well. They didn't have to hear it from us and who try to find ways to combat it. Uh, and it happens. Now in the media, they 
pretend to be marginalized and eliminated, you know, sent to the uh, uh, police desk. You're not really ready for big time work, you know, that sort of thing. And that kind of thing happens in the universities too, but probably to a slightly lesser extent. And it depends also on the field. So many fields in the university are almost totally free from outside pressures. Uh, physics department, pretty much. So. Some people have suggested that they should, that we should remove universities. That, and this is remin Jordan Peterson, for example, said, suggest to students, don't go to universities anymore because of the bias, because of the unitary point of views. And this is reminiscent of anarchist Ivan Illich's desire yeah. to eliminate. Listen to what Jordan Peterson is saying. He's saying universities are dominated by the left. Now for him, the left is anybody to the left of Attila the Hun. In fact, universities are dominated by the right. He's so far on the right that that looks like the left to him. But does it make sense to tell students not to go to universities? It's crazy. It's one of the places where you can, uh, there's lots of things wrong, but there are resources and opportunities that simply don't exist anywhere else. Uh, the, you can't, um, there are opportunities to become a free, independent, creative individual working with others uh, that you just don't have elsewhere. Uh, sorry, I miss, sorry, I misspoke. I didn't mean that to suggest that he suggested to eliminate the universities. I'm, I'm more trying to convey the decentralizing of universities. So, for example, an online school. There's a lot you miss in an online school. Your peers. One of the big parts of education is the students you're with, that those kinds of interactions are gone online. And they're very important for uh, educating oneself. Uh, anybody who's been in a, through a school or university situation knows how you can learn more from interaction with your peers than uh, from sitting in on a lecture. Uh, even interaction with the faculty. So it's one thing to sit in a lecture class or watch a television screen. And it's another thing to be in an actual class where you're interacting with other students and with the faculty. So yes, there are good things. I mean, I think it's good to try to extend the, the resources of a university elsewhere, but there's nothing to replace the direct face-to-face uh, -face interaction. Not just when you're in class, but when you're walk when you're doing something else, when you're uh, sitting in a McDonald's and having a hamburger with your friends and talking. What are your thoughts on the Christian anarchist Ivan Illich and his rise in popularity among social activists, an anarchist who believed in de-schooling society? His popular work. I can sort of understand some of the motivation for it, but. The de-schooling society is taking away from people some of their major opportunities for individual growth and social interaction and even uh, even general activism. I mean, it's not just pure accident that over the years, student activism has been one of, uh, typically at the forefront of many of the most important social movements. Uh, partly it's just because young people are a period of their life when they're relatively free, but it's also the fact that they're together. They can talk with one another. They can interact. Uh, that's something that's pretty much missing in atomized uh, capitalist society. Then I, I'm running into a little bit of a confusion here. On the one hand, the history of intellectuals in academia uh, sort of lines up with the status quo um, in the sense that we were talking about Nazism and things before. But on the other hand, they're on the forefront of social change. How, how are these views compatible? Their participants are in the forefront of social change. Uh, the mainstream may be status quo and conservative, which it is. Take a look at student activism. It's usually opposed by the administration and most of the faculty, but nevertheless, it takes place because this is a relatively free institution, which means that there are opportunities to break out of the uh, doc doctrinaire uh, system of attempted reorientation. 
you know, we're not living in uh, totalitarian dictatorships where if you say the wrong thing, you get sent to the, uh, to the concentration camp. We're living in societies with a relative degree of freedom, uh, often uh, infringed by authoritarian structures, but they don't have the kind of force they do if the SS troops are standing behind you. We shouldn't compare ourselves with that. In that case, what is an anarcho-syndicalist's take on education, on what it should look like and what needs to change from how it is now to how it should be? Well, actually, uh, the anarchist movement, not just the anarcho-syndicalists, were in the forefront of developing progressive education systems. So, for example, in Spain, where the 1936 revolution was the lead of the most successful, so for example, of an anarchist revolution. That was preceded by uh, decades of uh, educational effort in villages and towns everywhere, trying to create a free, liberatory uh, environment in which students could find their own ways, uh, their creativity would be sponsored, they would work jointly with one another, very similar to progressive education tendencies, uh, say with John Dewey's and others. Uh, which I happened to benefit from as a child, in fact, I'm familiar with and taught that way as well. So yes, uh, anarchist education has been very progressive. And there's also people like Paulo Freire who argued that uh, it should be an interactive process where the teacher's learning from the students, not just students having an opportunity for freedom. That's what, uh, uh, I think that's the kind of direction that uh, education should take the course that it should follow and does in the better places. Do you feel that if education is too centralized, these alternative platforms will be sidelined, neglected in the public sphere? Or for example, uh, in universities that student participation would get minimalized? I don't think there's a simple answer. You could have a public education system which fosters uh, individual creativity, uh, freedom, uh, student initiative, and so on. You could have a scattered system of charter schools uh, which are business run and which impose discipline. It depends on the educational program, not whether it's central or not. It depends. Okay, I have a, a, a question that either you would think is are completely polar opposite or, or that they completely overlap. What were you thinking during your interview, your conversation with Foucault? And what were you thinking during your conversation with Ali G? With Ali, I didn't hear the first one. With Foucault and with Ali G? Well, it was quite different. In the case of Ali G, uh, there had been, a, I, I, had, I was not particularly interested in the interview, but the, I think it was the BBC or whoever was behind it, it gave me a big song and dance about how this is going to be a very serious interview and so on. So I finally agreed. As soon as he walked in, I, I realized this is a joke and tried to be polite, but uh, had, a, had a hard time with it. I didn't take it seriously enough. You mean to say you realized that it was a joke or you felt like the whole interview was a joke and you thought he was for real? The whole thing was obviously some kind of a effort at comedy, which I didn't want to be part of. And I was perfectly, I mean, it was on the tip of my tongue saying, look, this is enough, let's terminate it. But being polite, I went along with it for a while. Foucault is quite different. Uh, actually, we had spent, Foucault and I had spent a large part of the day together. The interview was, debate was in the evening. I was just walking around the Dutch countryside, uh, partly because we wanted to have a chance to talk, but partly to see if we could get by with him talking French and me talking English. Would we be able to understand each other or should we have a translator? And we finally f figured we could carry it off. I don't know much French, he doesn't know much English, but it worked. And the debate was about issues that are fairly serious issues. So it's about nothing before archaeology. We disagreed about a lot of things. I was kind of appalled by some of his views, but uh, it was uh, within the domain of rational discourse. Okay, I know your... you're a busy... Oh, sorry. I know you're a busy person. I only have two more questions, and they're super quick. One is, 
What are your thoughts on postmodernism? What do you agree with and what do you disagree with? Well, for about a couple of decades, I've had a very simple question that I've been posing to my postmodern friends. Can you find something in postmodernism which is not either a triviality uh, cloaked in polysyllables or is false? And nobody's answered it yet. So that's about all I can say. Okay, and then my last question was, you're extremely prolific. You've written, I think, over 100 books, at least on politics, and then many more on other subjects. How do you structure your day? What's your productivity look like, your routine? Yeah, right now, since my wife Valeria and I moved to Arizona, I'm not living in Cambridge anymore, my routine is to get up early in the morning, take our dogs out, and play with them for a while, and then read the newspaper and start looking at the huge quantity of email that piled up. If I can get rid of that, get to work on serious things. Ah, but did you clean your room? Hmm? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I said, ah, but did you clean your room? Clean my room? Yeah, Jordan Peterson reference. <laughs> so, there's very little oxygen in the room. It's mostly books and papers. It's not much clean. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor, and thank you. What's your wife's name? Valeria? Valeria. Valeria. Sorry? Valeria. Hi. 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 Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'll send you a link to this interview as well. I'll give you a copy of the interview. Sure. Okay. Please do. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Go back to playing with your dogs and make sure you clean up your room because I think that's the most important. I think that's more important than writing books. Mm -hmm.